From CPRI and the CPRI Knowledge Hub, this is Research Minutes, a weekly look at new and important research in education. Today we look at bias in the classroom and whether race and gender can play a role in a teacher's perceptions of their students. Teachers assigned higher ability ratings when they saw white sounding names than when they saw black or Hispanic sounding names. They assumed that girls, especially girls of color, had lower mathematical abilities than boys and white boys. We welcome USC's Yasmin Chopur Gentruck, co-author of a new study examining the grading practices and potential implicit biases of hundreds of K-12 math teachers. Chopur Gentruck joins CPRI Knowledge Hub Managing Editor Keith Hugh Miller to discuss her team's findings and their potential implications for policy, practice, and future research. I think the first thing we need to do is to acknowledge that implicit bias is an important problem affecting our students' success, career path, and academic self-concept. That's right now on Research Minutes. Hello and welcome to Research Minutes. I'm Keith Miller, Managing Editor of the Super Knowledge Hub. Today I have the pleasure of speaking with Yasemin Chopur Gentruk, uh, Assistant Professor of Education with the Rossier School of Education at the University of Southern California. Thanks so much for joining us, Yasemin. Thanks for having me. So today we're discussing your new study, which was co authored with NYU's Joseph Simpian, Indiana University's Sarah Lubinsky, and USC's Ian Thacker titled Teachers' Bias Against the Mathematical Ability of Female, Black, and Hispanic Students. Um, It was just published in Educational Researcher, and it examines the potential implicit biases teachers may hold when evaluating students of varying races and genders. To start, could you tell us what drew you to this line of research? Were there specific academic trends or research findings regarding race and gender in education that, that led you to conduct this study? Sure. Um, So the achievement gaps exist among students from different racial and ethnic backgrounds. In addition, women and people of color are underrepresented in STEM-related fields, which contributes to the current inequity in our society. Prior work suggests that school-related factors are contributing to achievement gap. We know this because uh, gaps by gender and race increase after schooling starts. In addition to schooling factors, cultural stereotypes such as mathematics require ability or certain groups may have more mathematical ability than others uh, seem to explain the underrepresentation of women and uh, people of color in STEM fields. This is why we were interested in stereotypical messages students might be receiving from mathematics teachers in the classroom. Students spend a significant amount of time with their teachers and receive receive explicit and implicit messages from their teachers regarding their performance or academic capacity. In addition, research suggests that teacher perception of their students' cognitive abilities shape their instructional decisions. Evidence also exists that teachers' expectations seem to be related to student academic performance. Um, this is why uh, we examine whether teachers held uh, subconscious stereotypical biases against girls and students of color. So prior to the study, what did the research say about race and gender bias in the classroom? Were there specific gaps in the literature that you were trying to fill or are questions that your team was hoping to answer? That's a great question. Uh, Very few studies have been done on teachers' explicit biases, uh, and these studies have found that teachers do not express gender or race-related stereotypical beliefs. Teacher implicit biases are mainly examined by teachers' over or underestimation of their own students' uh, performance or ability. So in these studies, uh, students' abilities have been assumed to be accurately captured by direct assessments, So teacher implicit biases have been defined as the the variance in teachers' evaluations that cannot be explained by student performance on on a direct assessment and uh, by random error. This misalignment between teachers' evaluations of their own students and students' performance on a direct assessment could be because teachers may know their students better or because uh, the assessment might not be capturing, might be capturing uh, limited aspects of student learning. So these studies make it difficult to distinguish teachers' accuracy from teachers' biases. 
So we wanted to conduct an experimental study that would separate teachers' accuracy uh, from teachers' biases. So there are a few experimental studies done with teachers. A large body of work has used differences in teachers' reaction time in associating gender or race with disciplines such as uh, mathematics, science, or art as an indicator of a uh, teacher's implicit bias. So if the teacher was taking more time to associate girls with mathematics than boys, this was used as an indicator of teacher's implicit bias. So these studies haven't explored gender and racial biases together. In addition, these studies uh, have captured more generic implicit biases rather than biases that could happen in real classroom settings. So our goal was to, to capture biases that could happen in mathematics classrooms. So we adapted a method uh, using audit studies in which gender or race-related names are uh, randomly assigned to evaluation objects. So if you are interested in whether teachers are biased in their grading, you will randomly assign a girl's name and a boy's name to the same student work and test whether on average teachers rate student work higher, grade student work higher when they see a boy name attached to it. So we found two other studies conducted uh, with teachers, but these studies were not done with mathematics teachers or they were not focusing gender and race together. Again, we were interested in teachers' implicit biases in math classrooms because girls and students of color might experience implicit biases because of their gender and race and uh, because we were worried that girls of color might be facing double biases uh, because of their, again, gender and race. So we wanted to focus on, on mathematics teachers' implicit biases. And to do that, you and your team actually conducted one of those randomized control trials that you were, you were just discussing. Uh, in this study, I believe it involved close to 400 teachers. Could you give us an overview of your approach to this work? How did you select the participants in the study and, and how did you examine their evaluations for indicators of bias? Uh, sure. Actually, the design process took a long time. First, we identify uh, NAEP problems we could use in the, the study, and then we decided which problems to, to get data from real students. And my students uh, in teacher education program administered these problems to their students from different uh, racial and gender groups. We then identify a set of student work that was incorrect, partially correct, and fully correct. So we made sure that students' handwriting would not imply any gender or race. We also identify names that were associated with white, Hispanic, and black girls and boys. We search published work, look at several websites to identify names, and check Google images for every single name to make sure that the names we had selected were associated with expected gender and race. Uh, we tested these names with teachers by asking them which race or gender came to mind when they saw each name. After we finalized the names, we imitated students' handwriting to write these names, and we then created all combinations of, of items by rotating gender and race across student works. So each student work, each student solution had a gender race associated name. So after we designed the, the survey, uh, we partnered with a professional development organization to collect data from mathematics teachers. The organization provided uh, teachers' email addresses and their background information. We didn't ask teachers about their own race or gender, and they didn't know that we had access to that information. We had to do this because we were trying to capture teachers' subconscious biases, so we didn't want them to become suspicious about the, the nature of the study. In addition, uh, we didn't tell teachers the real purpose of the study. Rather, we told them we needed their help to select items for a, uh, for a student assessment that would capture uh, students' knowledge and skills. Again, we didn't want to tell them the real purpose of the study because we wanted to capture subconscious biases that could happen when they were evaluating uh, student work, as in real-life settings. All teachers rated the same student work. The only difference was the name uh, assigned to these responses. And all teachers evaluated incorrect, partially correct, and correct responses uh, for Black, Hispanic, and white boys and girls. 
the teachers saw these uh, student solutions in a randomized order. We also control the, the item order in our analysis. So for each student work, teachers were asked to, to respond to two questions. First, we asked them to rate the correctness of the student solution. And second, we asked them to predict mathematical ability of that particular student based on the, the response they provided. Our analysis included all the teachers who rated all student work and who uh, we had um, their background information. Because gender and race specific names were randomly assigned to student work, if teachers had no biases, then student gender or race uh, would not predict teachers' ratings. So in our analysis, we use teacher scores for their evaluation of student performance or their ratings of student uh, ability predicted by the gender and race assigned to, to student work. Again, we control the, the item order, order and teachers as fixed effect uh, to control their influence on the observed relationship. Uh, we ran separate analysis for incorrect, partially correct and correct responses uh, to investigate where teacher implicit biases uh, were more prevalent. In addition to, to these uh, analysis, we also checked whether teachers' background characteristics were also associated with their implicit biases. We also examined whether teachers from different race uh, showed similar level of bias by looking at the, the interaction between teachers' race and assigned students' gender and race. So after all of that work and careful analysis, I'm, I'm very curious to to find out what your team learned. What was it that you found out about the teachers in your study? Uh, we found that teachers' rating of student performance were not different based on student gender or race. So teachers did not show any bias against any groups of students when they were evaluating correctness of student solution. This was true for incorrect, partially correct, or, uh, or fully correct responses. However, we found that teachers' ability ratings varied by gender and race in more ambiguous situations, so incorrect and partially correct solutions. Teachers assigned higher ability ratings when they saw white-sounding names uh, than when they saw black or Hispanic-sounding names. They assumed that girls, especially girls of color, had lower mathematical abilities than boys and white boys. Unfortunately, females of color were always rated lowest in terms of mathematical ability. And we didn't find any of the teacher background characteristics were related to their ratings, such as how well they knew math or how long they have been teaching. None of these characteristics were associated with their ratings. However, when we look at the teacher's race, we found that teachers of color rated mathematical ability of white students, both boys and girls, higher than the ability of students' color, and white teachers estimated boys' mathematical ability higher than girls' mathematical ability. I'm not sure if your team gave much thought to, to the whys or, or what might explain uh, those results, but I, I'm, I'm very curious to find out what you think the implications of your work uh, might be. I'd imagine these findings might be of interest not only to teachers, but to, to school leaders and potentially policymakers as well. Again, great question. Um, how do we fix this? We really need to know the mechanism underlying these responses. But uh, there are still few options uh, for teachers, school leaders, and, and uh, policymakers. I think the first thing we need to do is to acknowledge that implicit bias is an important problem affecting our students' success, career path, and academic self-concept. It is also uh, important to note that we found teacher implicit biases in more ambiguous situations. So uh, policymakers uh, need to come up with certain policies that protect students of color and girls in, the, in more ambiguous situations. Similarly, principals and teachers need to find a solution to, to make sure that they are not disadvantaging students of color or female students, again, in, in, in vague situations. We also need to leverage existing interventions or create new, more targeted interventions in teacher education and professional development programs to prompt teachers and educators to confront their biases. And my final question would be, do you think there are opportunities here for future research, um, either for your team or for others who are working in this area? Yes. Uh, we need to understand the, the underlying mechanism, and we also need to do more research to check 
whether these mechanisms are similar or different based on the combination of teacher's race uh, and gender. It could be that the underlying mechanism for white female teachers' implicit biases is totally different from uh, teachers of colors. The second area for future research is, is related to the investigating solutions. How can we create effective interventions, professional development to overcome uh, implicit biases? Well, this is just fantastic work, Yasemin, and I encourage all of our listeners to go and read the full article. Again, it's titled Teacher's Bias Against the Mathematical Ability of Female, Black, and Hispanic Students, and it was just published in Educational Researcher. Yasemin Chopper Genstruck, thanks so much for joining us today. I really enjoyed it. Thanks again for having me. Thanks for listening to this week's Research Minutes, presented by the CPRI Knowledge Hub. For more episodes of this podcast, or to subscribe to the series, visit us at researchminutes.org. To share your thoughts on today's episode, or to suggest future topics, follow us on Twitter at CPRI Hub. That's C-P-R-E Hub. That's C-P-R-E-Hub.